Hello, this is Dr. Mark Gavitt, and the title of this lecture is Thoracic Anesthesia for Nurse Anesthesia Practice. Required reading. The required reading are from the case studies in nurse anesthesia and nurse anesthesia textbooks. Objectives and outcome. These are the learning objectives and learning outcome for this lecture. Preoperative. When a patient with bronchogenic carcinoma is scheduled for pulmonary resection surgery, a thorough preoperative assessment is necessary, specifically focusing on thoracic anesthesia. This involves evaluating the patient's overall health with a particular emphasis on the cardiopulmonary system. Number one, degree of cardiopulmonary insufficiency. Cardiopulmonary evaluation. Understanding the heart and lung functions are crucial. It involves assessing the heart's ability to pump blood and the lung's efficiency in oxygenating the blood. Pulmonary function tests, or PFTs. These tests evaluate lung function and help in determining the extent of lung impairment. Cardiac assessment. Echocardiograms, stress tests, and other cardiac evaluations may be necessary to assess the heart's function. Two, intraoperative needs. Anesthetic management, determining the type of anesthesia and the suitable anesthetic agents. Ventilation strategy, selecting the appropriate mechanical ventilation strategy, ensuring that the remaining lung tissue is ventilated effectively during surgery. Hemodynamic monitoring, Continuous monitoring of blood pressure, heart rate, and other vital parameters to ensure stability during surgery. 3. Potential postoperative complications. Respiratory complications. These could include pneumonia, atelectasis, or respiratory failure, particularly because the surgery involves the lungs. Cardiac complications. Possibilities include myocardial infarction, or arrhythmias due to stress on the heart during surgery. Infection. Surgical site infections or systemic infections could occur postoperatively. Four, adequacy of postoperative quality of life. Functional status. Predicting how the surgery will impact the patient's ability to carry out daily activities. Pain management. Strategies to manage postoperative pain effectively, facilitating recovery. Long-term survival. Weighing the risks and benefits of surgery in terms of extending life expectancy and improving quality of life. Preoperative. When evaluating a patient with lung cancer for anesthesia before a surgical procedure, considering the four M's is a comprehensive approach to understanding the patient's overall health status and anticipating potential complications during and after the surgery. Number one, mass effects, obstructive phenomena. Tumors can cause obstructions in the airways. This can complicate ventilation during surgery. Obstructive phenomena can also lead to issues like obstructive pneumonia and lung abscesses. Vascular and nervous system involvement. Conditions like superior vena cava syndrome or involvement of the recurrent laryngeal or phrenic nerves are concerns due to tumor mass effects. Local extension. Consideration of how extensively the tumor has spread locally affecting the chest wall or mediastinum is essential for surgical planning. 2. Metastases Brain, bone, liver, and adrenal glands. Metastases to these areas can complicate the patient's overall condition, affecting neurological status, liver function, and hormonal balance. Assessment of spread Understanding the extent of metastasis helps in anticipating possible complications and planning the anesthesia and surgical approach accordingly. Three, medications. Chemotherapy effects. 
agents like bleomycin, doxorubicin, and cisplatin have specific toxicities to the lung, heart, and kidney, respectively, that need to be considered when planning anesthesia. Adjustment of anesthetic agents. The choice of anesthesia may be influenced by the patient's exposure to these medications and their side effects. 4. Metabolic effects. Hormonal and electrolyte imbalances. Conditions like Cushing disease and hypercalcemia due to parathyroid hormone-like proteins need to be managed. Neuromuscular considerations. Conditions like Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome due to its impact on muscle strength and respiratory function should be considered in the anesthetic management. Preoperative. Lung cancer is primarily classified into two categories, non-small cell lung carcinoma and small cell lung carcinoma, or SCLC. SCLC cells are derived from neuroendocrine tissue, enabling them to produce various hormones and physiologically active substances. The following are paraneoplastic endocrine syndromes associated with SCLC. Number one, syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion, or SIADH. In SIADH, there is an excessive production of antidiuretic hormone, or ADH, leading to water retention and hyponatremia. Preoperatively, it is essential to correct electrolyte imbalances to avoid complications during surgery. 2. Cushing's disease. Due to ectopic production of adrenocorticotropic hormone, or ACTH, or its precursors by the tumor cells, there is an overproduction of cortisol. It is vital to manage hypercortisolism preoperatively to ensure stable physiological conditions during surgery. 3. Lambert-Eaton Myasthenic Syndrome, or LEMS. This is a neurological disorder where the immune system attacks the neuromuscular junction leading to muscle weakness. Assessment and management of muscle strength and respiratory function are crucial preoperatively. The following are preoperative anesthesia considerations for patients with paraneoplastic endocrine syndromes. Number one, electrolyte management, ensuring that electrolytes are within normal ranges to avoid intraoperative complications. Two, Neurological assessment, evaluating the patient's neurological status, particularly when syndromes like LEMS are present. Three, hormonal regulation, managing hormone levels and their effects to ensure that the patient is stable for surgery. Four, multidisciplinary approach, collaborating with endocrinologists, neurologists, and other specialists for comprehensive Preoperative preparation. Preoperative. Lambert Eaton myasthenic syndrome is associated with small cell lung carcinoma. It is an autoimmune condition where antibodies target the voltage gated calcium channels at the nerve endings, affecting neurotransmission and causing muscle weakness, among other symptoms. The following describes the pathophysiology of LEMS. IgG autoantibodies target the presynaptic calcium channels, diminishing acetylcholine release. Due to reduced acetylcholine release, muscle weakness is prominent, generally starting in the legs and may improve with activity. 
The following are anesthetic considerations for patients with LEMS. Sensitivity to muscle relaxants. LEMS patients are highly sensitive to muscle relaxants like succinylcholine and non-depolarizing agents. This necessitates careful choice and dosing of muscle relaxants. Respiratory muscle function. Even though respiratory muscles are usually spared, their function should be thoroughly evaluated to anticipate possible respiratory complications. Autonomic dysfunction. Symptoms like orthostatic hypotension, urinary retention, and gastroparesis should be considered, and appropriate measures should be in place to manage them. Muscle strength. Continuous assessment of muscle strength and readiness to adapt the anesthetic technique based on the patient's muscle function. Muscle relaxant usage. Administering the minimal effective dose and continuous neuromuscular monitoring is essential. Stimulation techniques. Awareness that muscle strength might improve with repetitive nerve stimulation, aiding in the management of muscle tone during surgery. The following are key aspects of post-operative care for patients with LEMS. Respiratory support. Ensuring that respiratory support is available post-operatively if required. Autonomic symptom management. Continuous monitoring and management of autonomic symptoms in the post-operative period to ensure patient comfort and stability. Preoperative. Before surgery, patients with Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome, or LEMS, require a meticulous preoperative evaluation to tailor anesthesia and management plans effectively. The following are diagnostic confirmation for LEMS. Number one, calcium channel antibodies. The presence of these antibodies is a significant marker confirming the diagnosis of LEMS. Two, repetitive nerve stimulation. Improvement in muscle strength with this diagnostic intervention further corroborates the LEMS diagnosis. The following are therapeutic approaches to LEMS. Number one, guanidine hydrochloride, used to enhance the release of acetylcholine, thus improving muscle strength temporarily. Two, corticosteroids, plasmapheresis, and IV immunoglobulin. These therapies aim at modulating the immune system response, improving muscle strength. Three, three, four, diaminopyridine, or FERDAPC, enhances neurotransmission at the neuromuscular junction thus improving muscle strength. It is important to remember that due to the presynaptic nature of the disorder, blocking acetylcholinesterase with anticholinesterase drugs is usually not as effective in LEMS as it is in other myasthenic syndromes. The following are post-operative considerations for patients with LEMS. Number one, optimizing muscle strength. Efforts should be made to optimize the patient's muscle strength preoperatively using various therapeutic approaches available. Two, assessment. A thorough evaluation to determine the current status of muscle strength and respiratory function. 3. Medication planning. Planning the continuity or discontinuity of the medications used in managing LEMS, such as corticosteroids or guanidine during the perioperative period. 4. Anesthetic planning. 
developing a strategy that considers the disease's pharmacological and physiological impacts with attention to relaxant sensitivity and potential respiratory implications. 3,4-diaminopyridine. 3,4-diaminopyridine or 3,4-DAP is a therapeutic agent primarily utilized in the management of Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome or LEMS. 3,4-DAP is a broad spectrum potassium channel blocker that predominantly acts on the presynaptic voltage-gated potassium channels at the neuromuscular junction. By blocking potassium channels and inhibiting the efflux of potassium ions, 3,4-DAP affects the membrane potential of the presynaptic nerve terminal. When potassium channels are blocked, there is prolonged depolarization, keeping calcium channels open longer, thus enhancing calcium influx. Due to the enhanced calcium influx, a larger amount of acetylcholine is released into the neuromuscular junction. The action potentials at the nerve terminals are prolonged, further facilitating the release of acetylcholine. As a result of the increased availability of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction, there is an improvement in muscle strength and neurotransmission in LEMS patients. While the above mechanisms are understood, the complete spectrum of how 3,4-DAP exerts its therapeutic effects in LEMS is still a subject of ongoing research. Preoperative. The following are preoperative indications for thoracic surgery. Number one, pulmonary disease. Diagnosis, biopsy and staging of cancer, identification of diseases like tuberculosis, mesothelioma, pulmonary interstitial fibrosis, and solitary nodules. Treatment includes lung resection, lobectomy, volume reduction surgery, and drainage and treatment of pleural effusions through various means. Trauma management, traumatic thoracic injury evaluation, tissue-related procedures, tissue resection methods like decortication, empyectomy, removal of bullae, blebs, and granulomas. Two, esophageal disease. Diagnosis, biopsy and staging of cancer. Treatments, procedures like vagotomy, heller myotomy, Zanker diverticulum treatment, and esophagectomy. Additionally, gastroesophageal reflux disease, or GERD, might be managed with a Nissen fundoplication. 3. Mediastinal disease. Diagnosis, biopsy and staging of cancer. Treatment includes surgical resection of tumors in the mediastinum. 4. Cardiac and vascular procedures. Congenital heart disease. Patent ductus arteriosus ligation. Vascular treatments. Internal mammary dissection, pericardial window, and stripping. Heart surgeries. Procedures like minimally invasive direct coronary bypass. 5. Miscellaneous. Spine and neck. Procedures for thoracic anterior vertebral surgery. Neurological. Treatment for sympathetic nerve-related issues, such as chronic reflex pain syndrome or hyperhidrosis. Foreign body removal. Extraction of intrathoracic foreign objects, such as sheared catheters. Preoperative. 
The preoperative evaluation for pulmonary surgery is crucial to ensure patient safety, predict potential intraoperative and postoperative complications, and optimize the patient's condition before the surgery. The following are key aspects regarding preoperative evaluation for pulmonary surgery. Number one, evaluation of comorbidities. It is important to assess a patient's overall health and any associated diseases. This gives insight into potential complications and the patient's ability to recover post-surgery. Two, smoking-related complications. Chronic smoking can lead to various lung pathologies and affect lung function, increasing the risk during surgery. Three, core pulmonal, a condition where the right side of the heart fails due to prolonged high blood pressure in the pulmonary arteries and right ventricle of the heart. It is caused by chronic hypoxia, hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, elevated pulmonary artery pressure, and increased right ventricular afterload leading to dysfunction or failure. Four, effects of perineoplasms. Some cancers can produce hormones or other substances that affect distant organs or tissues, leading to symptoms not directly related to the tumor. Five, cardiovascular disease. Conditions like unstable angina, recent myocardial infarction within six weeks, and significant dysrhythmias increase the risk of cardiac complications during and after the surgery. Six, diagnostic tests can be obtained to determine signs of cardiovascular dysfunction and effects of lung pathology. These tests include chest radiography, which helps in visualizing lung pathologies and other chest structures, electrocardiogram, which provides information on heart rhythms and electrical activity, echocardiogram, is useful in assessing heart structure, function, and signs of cardiovascular dysfunction. Seven, surgery specific risks. During procedures like pneumonectomy or extensive partial resection, clamping the pulmonary vasculature increases pulmonary vascular resistance, leading to increased right ventricular afterload and strain. Any evidence of increased pulmonary vascular resistance heightens the risk of right ventricular dysfunction or failure. This, in turn, can lead to increased postoperative complications after lung resection. 8. Echocardiography is a crucial tool for assessing pulmonary hypertension. It provides detailed information about cardiac filling, contractility, and the performance of the heart valves. Preoperative. The following are key aspects regarding preoperative laboratory assessment and testing before thoracic surgery. Number one, electrolytes. Abnormal levels can suggest issues with kidney function, dehydration, or other conditions that may need to be managed before surgery. Two, blood count. It provides information about the patient's general health, anemia status, infection, and more. Three, albumin. Albumin levels below 3.6 grams per deciliter indicate hypoalbuminemia. This can signal malnutrition, which has been identified as an important predictor of pulmonary complications post-surgery. Four, renal function indicators. A blood urea nitrogen or BUN level greater than 22 milligrams per deciliter is seen as a predictive factor for potential pulmonary complications post-surgery. Elevated BUN might suggest decreased kidney function or other conditions. Five, blood gas analysis. Measures oxygen and carbon dioxide levels in the blood. It helps determine how well the lungs move oxygen into the blood 
and remove carbon dioxide from the blood. While blood gas analysis and hypercapnia are not consistent predictors of increased risk of pulmonary complications perioperatively, preoperative hypoxemia or desaturation during exercise can be indicative of an increased risk of complications after thoracic surgery. 6. Cardiopulmonary Reserve and Exercise Testing These tests evaluate the heart and lungs capacity to endure the stress of surgery and predict potential complications. Cardiopulmonary exercise testing measures the heart and lungs efficiency and can indicate how a patient might tolerate surgery and anesthesia. Preoperative. The following are key aspects regarding cardiopulmonary reserve and exercise testing. Number one, maximal oxygen consumption or VO2 max. This is the maximum rate of oxygen consumption measured during incremental exercise. VO2 max is a measure of an individual's aerobic fitness level. VO2 max testing during exercise is a robust predictor of patient outcomes following surgery. A higher VO2 max suggests better cardiovascular fitness and a potentially lower risk of complications postoperatively. Two, stair climbing ability. This is the physical ability of a patient to climb stairs and is often used as a practical measure of cardiovascular and pulmonary fitness. There is an inverse relationship between stair climbing ability and post-operative pulmonary complications. This means that patients who have difficulty climbing stairs or can climb fewer flights of stairs before experiencing symptoms may have a higher risk of post-operative complications. Three, minute ventilation relative to CO2 exhalation, or VE divided by VCO2. This test measures ventilatory efficiency. Ventilatory efficiency is the relationship between the amount of air ventilated, or VE, and the amount of carbon dioxide produced, or VCO2. The formula is slope, or M, is equal to VE, or the amount of air ventilated in liters per minute, divided by the amount of carbon dioxide produced, or VCO2, in liters per minute. A VE to VCO2 slope of 25 to 30 is considered normal. A VE to VCO2 slope greater than 35 is associated with conditions such as heart failure, pulmonary artery hypertension, and mild COPD. It is also strongly correlated with an increased probability of mortality and postoperative complications. VE to VCO2 measurement is particularly useful in clinical practice for preoperative evaluation, especially before lung resection, as it provides insights into the patient's pulmonary function and efficiency. Elevated levels and values indicate decreased ventilatory efficiency suggesting that the lungs are working harder to expel the same amount of carbon dioxide, potentially indicating underlying pulmonary or cardiovascular conditions. Preoperative. Preoperative pulmonary function test or PFT assessment is crucial for evaluating a patient's lung function and respiratory health before undergoing surgery especially for procedures that may affect the respiratory system. Multiple functional variables must be considered because no single pulmonary function measurement gives a complete risk assessment. The following are these components. Number one, obstruction to airflow. Forced expiratory volume in the first second, or FEV1 measures the volume of air 
that can be forcibly exhaled in one second. It is useful in assessing the presence of obstructive lung diseases like asthma or COPD. Forced vital capacity, or FVC, represents the total volume of air that can be forcibly exhaled after a full inhalation. It helps in evaluating restrictive lung diseases. Assessing FEV1 and FVC helps in identifying whether there is an obstruction in the airways that might be improved with bronchodilators or other therapies. Two, parenchymal function, diffusing capacity of the lungs to carbon monoxide, or DLCO. This assesses how well oxygen and carbon dioxide are transferred between the lungs and the bloodstream. Alterations in DLCO could point towards parenchymal lung diseases like pulmonary fibrosis or emphysema. DLCO provides information on the gas exchange capacity of the lungs, highlighting issues in the lung tissues themselves. Three, cardiopulmonary reserve. Maximal oxygen consumption, or VO2 max, indicates the maximum rate of oxygen consumption during exhaustive exercise. It reflects the overall cardiopulmonary fitness and endurance. Minute ventilation relative to carbon dioxide exhalation measures ventilatory efficiency and the ability of the respiratory system to eliminate carbon dioxide. These tests help in determining the overall respiratory fitness and how well the patient might tolerate the stress of surgery. Four, pulmonary assessment of spirometry. Post bronchodilator therapy values. Spirometry values, especially post bronchodilator therapy, are essential as they show the potential lung function once optimized on medications. Response to bronchodilators. An improvement of more than 12% in FEV1 post bronchodilator use is considered significant and may indicate reversible airway obstruction commonly seen in asthma. Using post bronchodilator values ensures that the assessment is based on the best possible lung function, which is crucial for evaluating the patient's risk and operative planning. Preoperative. Preoperative perfusion scanning can predict the likelihood of hypoxemia during one lung ventilation. This is essential during surgeries involving a lung where one lung is ventilated while the other is not. The degree of perfusion in the operative lung corresponds to the potential shunt produced when ventilation to that lung ceases. A shunt in this context refers to the bypassing of the alveoli by the blood, resulting in decreased oxygenation. As previously mentioned, DLCO measures the ability of the lungs to transfer gases, like oxygen and carbon dioxide, across the alveolar capillary membrane. It helps in assessing the functional status of the lung tissues themselves. A DLCO value less than 40% of the predicted value is a concerning sign and is associated with increased complications after lung surgery. DLCO as an independent measure has high specificity, meaning it is reliable in identifying those without disease or true negatives. However, it has low sensitivity, meaning it might miss identifying some people who do have lung abnormalities or low true positives. Considering both DLCO and forced expiratory volume 
in one second, or FEV1, in a combined manner or as a product could offer a more reliable evaluation. This approach can give a more holistic view of the patient's lung function by considering both airflow and gas exchange capacities. Preoperative. Each lung is divided into lobes, and each lobe further divides into subsegments. The number of subsegments varies between the right and left lungs. The right lung has three lobes. These lobes are the upper with six subsegments, middle with four subsegments, and lower with 12 subsegments. In total, the right lung has 22 subsegments. The left lung has two lobes, the upper with 10 subsegments and lower with 10 subsegments. In total, the left lung has 20 subsegments. Combined for both lungs, there are a total of 42 subsegments. When planning for a lung surgery, it is crucial to predict how the operation will impact pulmonary function. This prediction or predicted post-operative or PPO FEV1 or DLCO calculation is based on the number of subsegments being affected by the surgery in comparison to the total subsegments in both lungs. For example, if a patient is scheduled for a lobectomy of the lower lobe of the left lung, the effect on their lung function can be estimated as follows. Number one, initial calculation. The left lung's lower lobe has 10 subsegments. Therefore, the fraction of lung to be removed is equal to 10 subsegments of the lower left lobe divided by 42 total subsegments for both lungs, which is equal to 0.24 or 24%. Number two, PPO FEV1 calculation. If the patient's preoperative FEV1 is 50% of the predicted value, after the surgery, there will be a predicted reduction in FEV1 by 24%. And the PPO FEV1 is equal to 50% preoperative predicted multiplied by 1 minus 0.24, which is equal to 38% predicted. 3. PPO DLCO calculation. If the preoperative DLCO is 40% of predicted, the PPO DLCO after the surgery will be PPO DLCO is equal to 40% preoperative predicted multiplied by 1 minus 0 0.24 which is equal to 30.4% predicted. These predictions are essential for both the surgical team and the patient. They provide an estimate of how the surgery will impact lung function, allowing for better preoperative planning, postoperative care, and setting appropriate patient expectations. Knowing the potential impact on lung function is especially vital for high-risk surgeries or patients with already compromised lung function. Preoperative. Preoperative assessments of lung function are crucial in determining a patient's risk during pulmonary surgery. By evaluating various measures, clinicians can categorize patients into average risk and elevated risk categories, which help guide surgical decision-making and postoperative care. 
Patients falling into the average risk category typically have better lung function, suggesting they may tolerate surgery without significant complications. Number one, FEV1 and DLCO. An average risk patient has an FEV1 greater than two liters and a DLCO greater than 80% of the predicted value. PPO FEV1. An average risk patient has a predicted post-operative FEV1 greater than 80% of the predicted value. Three, combined PPO values. An average risk patient has both PPO FEV1 and PPO DLCO greater than 40% for VO2 max. This is the maximal amount of oxygen that can be utilized during intense exercise. It is measured in milliliters per kilogram per minute. An average risk patient has a VO2 max greater than 15 milliliters per kilogram per minute. Five, physical ability. An average risk patient has the ability to climb three flights of stairs without significant difficulty. Patients in the elevated risk category have compromised lung function, indicating they may have a higher chance of complications during or after surgery. Number one, FEV1 less than two liters and DLCO less than 80% of the predicted value. Two, PPO FEV1 less than 40% of the predicted value. Three, PPO DLCO less than 40% of the predicted value. Four, VO2 max less than 10 milliliters per kilogram per minute. Five, PPO product. The combined product of PPO FEV1 and PPO DLCO is less than 1,650. Six, physical ability. Inability to climb a single flight of stairs. Seven, oxygen desaturation. A drop in oxygen levels or desaturation of more than 4% during exercise is a significant indicator of reduced lung function. By analyzing these parameters, healthcare providers can make informed decisions about surgical suitability, potential complications, and required postoperative care. Preoperative. The 80 40 35 15 rule in preoperative lung function testing is a helpful mnemonic to guide clinicians in determining the risk profile of a patient undergoing pulmonary surgery. Number one, 80% rule. When a patient's FEV1 and DLCO are both greater than 80% of the predicted values, it indicates relatively healthy lung function. Such patients typically do not require further preoperative lung function testing. If either of these parameters is less than 80%, or if the patient has symptoms of dyspnea, further testing such as predicting the post-operative function is recommended. Two, 40% rule. Predicted post-operative values estimate how a patient's lung function will be after surgery. If both PPO FEV1 and PPO DLCO are less than 40% of the predicted values, it indicates that the patient might have significantly reduced 
lung function post-surgery. Such patients are at an increased risk of complications post-surgery, and exercise testing should be evaluated to further assess their fitness for surgery. 3. 35 Rule VE to VCO2 slope represents the relationship between the amount of carbon dioxide produced and the volume of air ventilated. A slope greater than 35 indicates inefficient ventilation relative to metabolic demand. Patients with a VE to VCO2 slope greater than 35 are at an increased risk of mortality and postoperative complications. It signifies that the lungs may not be efficiently removing carbon dioxide relative to the amount being produced. 4. 15 rule. VO2 max measures the maximal amount of oxygen a person can use during intense exercise. A value less than 15 milliliters per kilogram per minute indicates decreased cardiopulmonary fitness. Patients with a VO2 max below this threshold are at an increased risk of postoperative complications. Preoperative. Preoperative preparations are crucial for enhancing a patient's readiness for surgery and ensuring the best possible outcome postoperatively. These preparations are often termed prehabilitation. Prehabilitation is the process of enhancing a patient's functional capacity before surgery to improve tolerance to upcoming stressors. Addressing acute or reversible respiratory conditions can significantly decrease the risk of complications after surgery. The following are some of these conditions and their implications. Number one, infection. Respiratory infections can exacerbate pre-existing lung diseases and reduce pulmonary reserves. Active infections should be treated and controlled before elective surgeries. 2. Bronchial secretions. Excessive bronchial secretions can block airways and impair gas exchange. Physiotherapy, mucolytics, and hydration can help in clearing these secretions. 3. Bronchospasm. Constriction of the airways can reduce airflow and lead to respiratory distress. Bronchodilators can be used preoperatively to reduce bronchospasm in patients with conditions like asthma. 4. Dehydration. Dehydration can make bronchial secretions thicker and harder to clear. Ensuring adequate hydration can help mitigate this. 5. Electrolyte imbalance. Electrolyte imbalances, especially of potassium and magnesium, can exacerbate conditions like bronchospasm. 6. Alcohol abuse. Chronic alcohol consumption can suppress the immune system, affect lung function, and increase the risk of postoperative complications. It is important to assess and manage alcohol use preoperatively. 7. Malnutrition. Malnutrition can reduce a patient's ability to heal post-surgery and increase the risk of infections. Nutritional supplementation and counseling can be beneficial. Smoking is a well-known risk factor for chronic lung diseases like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, and chronic bronchitis. It also impairs the lung's ability to clear secretions and reduces immune function. It is a significant predictor of perioperative complications, including wound infections, respiratory complications, and prolonged hospital stays. Advising patients to quit smoking, even if temporarily before surgery, can significantly reduce these risks. Ideally, patients should cease smoking at least four to six weeks prior to elective surgery to derive the maximum benefit. Preoperative. Managing pain perioperatively 
especially after thoracic surgeries, is critical not only for the patient's comfort, but also to prevent post-operative complications. Acute pain, especially after thoracic surgeries, can lead to a protective phenomenon called splinting. Splinting refers to the involuntary guarding or contraction of muscles surrounding a painful area. When the pain is located near the lungs or diaphragm, this can have significant respiratory consequences. Severe pain can cause patients to take shallow breaths, which can decrease overall lung expansion and contribute to reduced oxygen exchange. Furthermore, the effort of breathing may be diminished due to pain, leading to hypoxemia and an accumulation of carbon dioxide, which can cause respiratory acidosis. Post-thoracotomy pain syndrome or PTPS, is a chronic pain condition characterized by persistent pain along the thoracotomy incision site even after the surgical wound has healed. This can lead to 1. Pneumonia. Due to decreased respiratory effort and shallow breathing, secretions can accumulate and result in infections. 2. Atelectasis. Small airways and alveoli may collapse due to reduced lung expansion leading to atelectasis. Effective pain management post-thoracotomy is aimed at striking the right balance between ensuring patient comfort and preventing respiratory depression, especially in patients with compromised lung function. Here are some strategies. 1. Regional anesthesia. Techniques like epidural, paravertebral, intercostal, and erector spinae block can numb specific regions, thus reducing pain. 2. Epidural anesthesia. Administering medications like opioids or local anesthetics at the T6 to T8 level in the spine is seen as a highly effective method for controlling post-thoracotomy pain. 3. Multimodal analgesia. Combining various pain relieving drugs like ketamine, dexmedetomidine, acetaminophen, and non steroidal analgesics can enhance the pain relieving effects of epidurals. This combination can potentially reduce complications like atelectasis, pneumonia, and respiratory failure. 4. Cryoanalgesia. This involves using cold temperatures to numb nerve endings, thus providing pain relief. 5. Local anesthetic infiltration. Directly infusing local anesthetics around the surgical site can numb the area and reduce pain. 6. Postoperative patient controlled analgesia, or PCA. PCA devices allow patients to self administer pain medications typically opioids at safe intervals. This ensures constant pain relief while maintaining some level of patient autonomy. Preoperative. The images provided are of preoperative, multi-detector, computer tomography, or CT scans of the chest, along with their corresponding three-dimensional reconstructions. Let us break down the descriptions and observations for each set. Left. This scan is from a 23-year-old healthy volunteer. The trachea is in the middle, and there is a normal distribution of the bifurcation of the bronchi. Top right. This is from a 60-year-old healthy volunteer. The trachea is seen to be in the middle, but there is a narrowing of the right and main stem bronchus. Bottom right. This is from a 62-year-old male smoker with chronic emphysema. The trachea is displaced to the right side and there is a narrowing on the bronchial bifurcation. The changes reflect the smoking history and age. From these images, a few general observations can be made. The first two sets of images show what can be inferred as healthy lung anatomy, 
even though the 60-year-old volunteer has some narrowing, it might still fall within the normal range for that age group. The last set depicts pathological changes commonly seen in chronic smokers. Emphysema can lead to the destruction of alveolar walls, reducing the surface area for gas exchange. Over time, this can lead to a displacement of the trachea and changes in the bronchial structure. The CT scan provides a visualization of these changes, and the 3D reconstruction gives a clearer, more comprehensive view of the overall lung anatomy and the abnormalities present. When assessing these images, especially in the context of preoperative evaluation, it is essential to consider how any observed abnormalities might impact surgical planning, anesthesia considerations, and postoperative care. For example, the patient with emphysema might require special care during surgery to prevent further lung damage and would likely benefit from specific postoperative respiratory therapies. Intraoperative. Number one, large bore intravenous access. Patients presenting for thoracic surgery should have large bore intravenous access into a peripheral vein or a central vein using the internal jugular, subclavian, or femoral veins. Large bore IVs allow for rapid fluid administration, which may be necessary during surgery, especially if there is significant blood loss. 2. Standard AANA monitors. As with all anesthesia cases, patients presenting for thoracic surgery should have standard monitors set by the AANA. These typically include pulse oximetry, non-invasive blood pressure monitoring, and electrocardiography. Additional monitors can be used to ensure the patient's safety during anesthesia and surgery. 3. Arterial pressure monitoring. Invasive arterial pressure monitoring provides real-time data on a patient's blood pressure and can help in obtaining arterial blood gases. When patients are positioned in the lateral decubitus position for thoracic surgeries, the arterial cannula should be placed in the dependent arm to get the most accurate readings given the impact of gravity. 4. Central venous and pulmonary artery pressure monitoring. These monitoring techniques provide valuable information about a patient's cardiovascular status, particularly the function of the right heart and the lungs. They can give insights about the preload, afterload, and cardiac output. 5. Potential for pneumothorax with central lines. When inserting central lines, there is a risk of puncturing the lung, which can lead to pneumothorax. A pneumothorax on the non-operative side is particularly concerning during one lung ventilation because it can significantly compromise oxygenation. 6. Increased filling pressures and lung injury. Elevated central venous or pulmonary capillary wedge pressures can indicate fluid overload or cardiac issues. These increased pressures have been linked to higher chances of lung injury and extended time on mechanical ventilation post-complex pulmonary surgery. 7. Placement of pulmonary artery catheter and lung separation device. When a lung resection is planned, it is crucial to ensure that any catheters or devices are not located in a vessel or bronchus that will be clamped or cut during the procedure. Misplacement can lead to complications, including damage to the vessel or bronchus. Intraoperative, post lateral thoracotomy. A thoracotomy is a surgical incision into the chest wall allowing access to the thoracic organs, primarily the lungs. The term posterolateral describes the location and orientation of the incision. It is made lateral 
and towards the posterior of the patient. The fourth or fifth interspace refers to the space between the fourth and fifth ribs. This location provides a good balance between achieving adequate exposure to the lungs and minimizing potential damage to critical structures. This approach is commonly used for many types of lung surgeries, including lobectomies and pneumonectomies. The advantage of this incision is that it offers a wide view of the chest cavity and allows for easier manipulation of the lung tissue. Video Assisted Thoracoscopic Surgery, or VATS. VATS is a minimally invasive surgical technique that utilizes a thoracoscope and specialized instruments introduced through small incisions. Instead of one large incision, several small incisions are made. The placement of these incisions is crucial and is determined by several anatomical landmarks to ensure optimal access and minimize potential complications. These landmarks include ribs, arm, diaphragm, and scapula. The goal of VATS is to achieve the same surgical outcomes as traditional open surgery, but with less pain, a shorter hospital stay, and quicker recovery for the patient. Positioning. The lateral decubitus position is commonly used in thoracic surgeries, specifically for thoracotomies. When a patient is positioned in the lateral decubitus position, they are lying on their side with the surgical side facing upwards. The following are key points regarding the lateral decubitus position for thoracic surgery. Number one, intercostal surgical access and visualization. The lateral decubitus position provides surgeons with access between the ribs or intercostal to the thoracic cavity without or minimizing the need for rib spreading or resection. Two, preferred for thoracotomy. Thoracotomy is a surgical incision into the chest wall. Since the procedure demands clear access to lung tissues and associated structures, the lateral decubitus position is most commonly employed. This position provides the surgeon with the most direct and least obstructed access to the thoracic cavity. Three, protection of the neurovascular bundle. The axillary roll placed just beneath the torso below the axilla helps prevent compression of the neurovascular bundle. This bundle consists of nerves, arteries, and veins that supply the arm. Compressing it could lead to complications like numbness, pain, or even tissue damage. In addition, monitoring the circulation to the hand is vital. It can be achieved through pulse oximetry or regular palpation of the radial pulse. 4. Brachial plexus concern. Overstretching or hyperabducting the arms can stress the brachial plexus, which is a network of nerves that send signals from the spine to the shoulder, arm, and hand. Damage to this could result in numbness, weakness, or paralysis of the arm. 5. Head and neck alignment. It is crucial to ensure that the head and neck remain aligned with the spine to prevent undue strain or injury. Misalignment can cause post-operative discomfort or complications related to the nervous system. Six, ventilation of the dependent lung. In the lateral decubitus position, the lung on the side the patient is lying on or the dependent lung receives less ventilation. This is due to pressure from the mediastinum, abdominal contents, and potential suboptimal positioning, which can compress it. This could lead to decreased oxygenation and potential respiratory complications postoperatively. Positioning. The reverse Trendelenburg position 
involves elevating the head while the feet are tilted downwards. This positioning is sometimes used in esophageal surgery and has specific physiological effects on the body. Number one, cardiovascular system. Decreased venous return. When the legs and feet are tilted downwards, gravity reduces the venous return to the heart. This can subsequently decrease the cardiac preload. Decreased cardiac output and mean arterial pressure. A reduced preload can lead to decreased cardiac output and a consequent decrease in mean arterial pressure. Compensatory mechanisms. The body may respond to this reduced output and pressure by increasing the heart rate and sympathetic tone. This can also increase peripheral vascular resistance to help maintain blood pressure. Two, respiratory system. Improved lung volumes. Elevating the head can reduce pressure on the diaphragm from abdominal organs, leading to increased lung volumes. Increased functional residual capacity. With improved lung volumes, there is also an increase in functional residual capacity compared to the supine position. Three, neurological system. Altered cerebral perfusion. With the head positioned above the heart, cerebral perfusion pressure might decrease due to the effects of gravity. It is important to maintain adequate cerebral blood flow during surgery. Blood pressure measurement considerations. When considering cerebral perfusion, it is more accurate to measure blood pressure at the level of the circle of Willis in the brain. If you are using an arm cuff, you might need to adjust the readings to account for the gradient in hydrostatic pressure caused by the difference in height between the arm and the brain. Anatomy. The thoracic cavity, also known as the chest cavity, is a crucial region in the human body that houses vital organs such as the heart and lungs. It is encased by the rib cage and bounded by several structures. The following is an explanation of the anatomic boundaries of the thoracic cavity. Superior boundary. Number one, suprapleural membrane. This is a fibroelastic membrane that covers the apex of the lung. It stretches up into the neck over the top of the first rib. Two, thoracic outlet. This refers to the opening at the top of the thoracic cavity. The first thoracic vertebra, or T1, and the first rib mark its boundaries. Inferior boundary. Diaphragm. This is a dome-shaped muscle that plays a crucial role in breathing. It contracts and flattens when we inhale, and it relaxes and domes up when we exhale. The diaphragm also serves as the division between the thoracic cavity above and the abdominal cavity below. Lateral boundary, lungs and intercostal spaces. The lungs fill the majority of the thoracic cavity. Between each rib are spaces known as the intercostal spaces, which contain intercostal muscles, nerves, and blood vessels. Anterior boundary, number one, sternum. This is the flat bone in the center of the chest, and it is where the ribs connect through the costal cartilages. Two, costal cartilages. These are the cartilages that connect the ribs to the sternum. They provide elasticity and flexibility to the rib cage, allowing for expansion during respiration. Posterior boundary, thoracic vertebral bodies. These are the segments of the spine located in the thoracic region. There are typically 12 thoracic vertebra and they form the posterior boundary of the thoracic cavity. Each thoracic vertebra 
articulates with a pair of ribs. Anatomy. The vital organs and structures pertinent to the cardiovascular system within the thoracic cavity include number one, heart, two, great vessels, which include the thoracic aorta, main pulmonary artery, and all their branches, three, pulmonary veins, four, superior and inferior vena cava, and five, azygous vein, which is a vein located in the chest that is responsible for draining blood from the thoracic wall and upper abdominal wall, transporting it to the superior vena cava. The vital organs and structures pertinent to the respiratory system include number one, trachea, two, bronchi, and three, lungs. Anatomy. This is a anatomical 3D visualization focusing on the cardiovascular and respiratory systems. Please draw your attention to the aorta. The aorta is the largest artery in the body, originating from the left ventricle of the heart. After it emerges from the heart, it travels upward briefly as the ascending aorta, then curves backward and to the left in an arc-like shape known as the aortic arch, before descending as the thoracic aorta and then the abdominal aorta. The aortic arch is particularly interesting in its relation to the respiratory structures. Specifically, the arch of the aorta passes over the left mainstem bronchus, also known as the left primary bronchus, and sits anterior to or in front of the trachea and esophagus. As the trachea descends down the neck and into the thorax, it bifurcates into the right and left main stem bronchi at about the level of the fifth thoracic vertebra. Each main stem bronchus then enters its respective lung. The right main stem bronchus to the right lung and the left main stem bronchus to the left lung. The aortic arch, after ascending a short distance from the heart, curves over the left main stem bronchus. The descending thoracic aorta then continues its path downward just to the left of the vertebral column. This anatomical relationship is important as the positioning of the aorta relative to the bronchi and other structures can have clinical implications, especially in scenarios like certain congenital anomalies, aortic aneurysms or dissections, or in procedures like intubation. Anatomy. The vital structures pertinent to the digestive, endocrine, and lymphatic systems within the thoracic cavity include the esophagus, thymus, and thoracic duct. The thoracic duct collects lymph from the majority of the body, including both legs, the abdomen, the left side of the chest, and the left side of the head and neck. It transports this lymph, as well as lipids absorbed from the intestines, back to the venous blood. The thoracic duct originates in the abdomen. This is located around the level of the second lumbar vertebra. The thoracic duct then ascends through the diaphragm and into the thoracic cavity. It continues upwards, usually located slightly to the left of the vertebral column, and runs through the posterior mediastinum. The thoracic duct typically drains into the venous system at the junction of the left subclavian and left internal jugular veins, thus returning the lymph into the bloodstream. Injury to the thoracic duct during surgical procedures or trauma can lead to a condition called chylothorax, where lymph, 
especially the lipid-rich lymph after meals, accumulates in the pleural space. This can be identified by milky-looking fluid on a chest strain or thoracentesis. The nerves pertinent to the nervous system within the thoracic cavity include number one, the vagus nerve, two, phrenic nerve, three, recurrent laryngeal nerves, and four, bilateral sympathetic nerve chains. Anatomy. The pulmonary hilum, often simply referred to as the hilum, is a critical region on each lung and serves as the point through which various structures enter and exit the lung. The pulmonary hilum is the indented area on the medial side of each lung, where structures like the primary bronchi, blood vessels, and lymphatic vessels enter or leave the lung. It effectively acts as a gateway to the lung. The hyla are located on the medial aspect of each lung, facing the heart and opposite to the lateral convex surface of the lung. The following structures pass through the hilum. Number one, pulmonary artery. This carries deoxygenated blood from the heart to the lungs. In the hilum, the pulmonary artery is usually located superior to the bronchus and is the most anterior structure. Two, superior and inferior pulmonary veins. These transport oxygenated blood from the lungs back to the heart. Typically, they are found inferior to the bronchus and are the most posterior structures in the hilum. Three, main bronchus. Each main bronchus or primary bronchus enters its respective lung at the hilum and then branches into secondary and tertiary bronchi within the lung parenchyma. Four, hilar lymph nodes. These are small bean-shaped structures that are part of the lymphatic system. They filter the lymph fluid trapping bacteria, viruses, and other foreign substances, which are then eliminated by immune cells. There are some variations between left and right hyla. The right main bronchus is wider, shorter, and more vertical than the left, so aspirated objects are more likely to enter the right bronchus and lodge there. The left pulmonary artery may be located superiorly or at the same level as the main bronchus, whereas on the right side, the pulmonary artery is always superior to the bronchus. Radiologic examination of the hyla, such as chest x-rays or CT scans, is crucial in diagnosing conditions related to the heart, lungs, and great vessels. Enlargement or abnormal appearance of the hilar regions can indicate various diseases, including infections, tumors, or vascular abnormalities. Anatomy. The trachea is a tubular structure that connects the larynx to the bronchi of the lungs. It plays a vital role in the respiratory system, allowing for the passage of air to and from the lungs. The innermost layer of the trachea is lined with ciliated, pseudostratified columnar epithelium. This lining contains hair-like structures called cilia and mucus-producing goblet cells. The coordinated movement of cilia together with the mucus helps trap dust particles and microorganisms, moving them upwards towards the pharynx where they can be swallowed or coughed out. This mechanism aids in filtering and humidifying the incoming air, protecting the deeper parts of the respiratory system. The trachea is situated anterior to the esophagus. This anatomical arrangement is essential for the proper functioning of both respiratory and digestive systems. The anterior and lateral walls of the trachea are reinforced with C-shaped 
cartilaginous rings. These rings help the trachea from collapsing, ensuring an open airway. The open part of the C faces posteriorly towards the esophagus. The membranous posterior wall of the trachea, which does not have cartilaginous support, contains the tracheallis muscle. This muscle is smooth and allows for adjustments in tracheal diameter, particularly during coughing. The carina is a ridge of cartilage located at the points where the trachea divides into the left and right main stem bronchi. The bifurcation angle, which is sharp, is described as being oriented from 12 o'clock or anterior to 6 o'clock or posterior. The trachea bifurcates into two primary bronchi, the right main stem bronchus and the left main stem bronchus. These bronchi are the first generation of the bronchial tree. They are relatively large and at their origin do not immediately bifurcate, meaning there is a segment of each bronchus without branches. Anatomy. The following provided anatomical distances and their relevance in relation to the respiratory system are for individuals with a height of approximately 170 centimeters. The distance from the incisors to the vocal cords is approximately 15 centimeters. This measurement is crucial for intubation procedures. The distance from the vocal cords to the carina, where the trachea bifurcates into the right and left main stem bronchi, is approximately 12 centimeters. The bifurcation of the trachea into the main stem bronchi occurs at the level of the sternal angle. The sternal angle, also known as the angle of Louis, is a palpable bony prominence on the chest where the manubrium meets the body of the sternum. The right main stem bronchus lies at an angle of about 25 to 30 degrees from the tracheal axis. Its more vertical orientation predisposes it to be a common site for aspiration of foreign objects. The average distance from the tracheal carina to the branching point of the right upper bronchus is approximately 2 centimeters in men and 1.5 centimeters in women. The left main stem bronchus lies at a 45 degree angle from the tracheal axis, making it more angled compared to the right main stem bronchus. The distance from the tracheal carina to the takeoff points of the upper and left lower lobe bronchi is about 5 centimeters in men and 4.5 centimeters in women. An important anatomical relationship is that the left main stem bronchus lies beneath the aortic arch, which is a major blood vessel originating from the heart. Due to this anatomical relationship, the left main stem bronchus remains relatively fixed in its position. Anatomy the 3D image depicts a tracheal bronchial tree. This structure begins with the trachea and subsequently divides into the right and left main bronchi, which then branch out further into smaller bronchi and bronchioles. The topmost part with a more solid appearance is the larynx, which houses the vocal cords. Directly below the larynx is the trachea a tubular structure with rings that help keep it open for air passage. The trachea then divides into the right and left main bronchi. These bronchi serve as the primary passages for air entering the lungs. The right main bronchus is shorter and more vertical than the left, which is why foreign objects are more likely to end up in the right lung if aspirated. 
the branching pattern on the right side appears to have more divisions visible in this view. The left main bronchus is longer and more horizontal. You can also see that it has a close relationship with the aortic arch, which is not visible in the image, but would be positioned above and slightly to the left. As the main bronchi enter the lungs, they further divide into lobar bronchi. In humans, the right lung has three lobes, which are the upper, middle, and lower, while the left lung has two lobes, which are the upper and lower. Each lobe is supplied by its own lobar bronchus. These lobar bronchi then further divide into segmental bronchi, which supply specific bronchopulmonary segments of the lobes. The smallest visible branches in the image are smaller bronchi and bronchioles, which continue to branch and eventually lead to the alveoli where gas exchange occurs. Physiology. When a person is in an upright position, the lung tissue's weight particularly from the upper regions, exerts a downward force due to gravity. This pressure compresses the alveoli located in the inferior or lower and dependent parts of the lungs. This compression means that these alveoli are less expanded at the beginning of inspiration and are therefore on the steeper part of the lung's compliance curve. The lung's compliance curve relates volume change to the transpulmonary pressure. Being on the steeper portion means that for a given increase in pressure, these alveoli will experience a more significant volume change compared to alveoli that are already well expanded. As a result, during breathing or tidal ventilation, these alveoli receive the largest share of the inspired air volume or tidal volume. The slinky toy analogy is often used to describe the behavior of the lung, particularly the alveoli, in relation to gravity and how different portions of the lung expand. A slinky is a coiled spring toy that can be stretched and then returns to its original shape. When you hold a slinky at the top and let it dangle downward, the coils at the bottom will be compressed more due to the weight of the upper part of the slinky. Imagine the lung as the slinky. The top coils represent the upper parts of the lung, or the superior regions, and the compressed coils at the bottom represent the lower parts of the lung, or the inferior regions. Just as the bottom coils of a slinky are compressed more because of the weight from above, the alveoli in the lower parts of the lungs are more compressed because of the weight of the lung tissue from above. This compression makes these alveoli more recruitable, meaning they can expand more during inspiration. Just as the bottom coils of the slinky can stretch more and move more freely, the alveoli in the lower parts of the lungs receive a larger share of the tidal volume due to their position on the steeper part of the compliance curve. Blood flow or perfusion in the lungs is also influenced by gravity. Blood is drawn to the lower regions of the lungs due to the gravitational force when a person is upright. This means that more blood flows to the alveoli in the inferior and dependent parts of the lungs compared to the superior or upper parts. 
Therefore, there is an increased distribution of perfusion to the lower lung regions. Physiology. The relationship between ventilation and perfusion in the lungs is essential for understanding gas exchange and maintaining proper oxygenation and ventilation. The lungs are vertically oriented, so the effects of gravity play a crucial role in the distribution of both air and blood. Perfusion to the lungs is influenced more by gravity than is ventilation. As a result, the gradient in blood flow from the top or non-dependent to the bottom or dependent regions of the lung is steeper than the gradient for ventilation. In other words, the lower or dependent parts of the lungs receive more blood flow than the upper parts, and this difference is greater than the difference in airflow between the same regions. Because of these differing gradients for ventilation and perfusion, various regions of the lung will have different ventilation to perfusion or VQ ratios. Ideally, we want a one to one ratio where each alveolus receives one unit of air for every unit of blood it sees. However, the lower regions of the lung tend to have slightly lower ventilation to perfusion ratios due to greater blood flow relative to ventilation, and the upper regions have higher ventilation to perfusion ratios due to less blood flow relative to ventilation. The spectrum of ventilation to perfusion ratios means some areas are more optimized for oxygen uptake, more specifically the lower parts, while others are more optimized for carbon dioxide removal, or the upper parts of the lung. Despite the differences in VQ ratios throughout the lung, gas exchange remains efficient. This is because the total area available for gas exchange is vast, and even regions with non-optimal VQ ratios still contribute to effective oxygenation and carbon dioxide removal. When a person is awake in a lateral position with a closed chest and breathing spontaneously, the effects of gravity on ventilation and perfusion are somewhat altered compared to when they are upright. In this position, the dependent lung usually receives more ventilation and perfusion compared to the non-dependent lung. However, because both ventilation and perfusion are increased in the dependent lung, they tend to be relatively matched, maintaining efficient gas exchange. Physiology. Ideally for efficient gas exchange, ventilation should match perfusion. In the anesthetized lateral position, closed chest, spontaneously breathing patient, this matching is disrupted, leading to a ventilation to perfusion or VQ mismatch. Anesthesia can reduce the functional residual capacity or FRC of the lungs. The FRC is the volume of air remaining in the lungs after a normal exhalation. The induction of anesthesia causes a loss of this lung volume in both lungs. Despite the overall loss of lung volume due to anesthesia, the non-dependent lung or the lung on the top side when the patient is lying on their side receives more ventilation. This is because the dependent lung, or the lung on the bottom, is compressed by the weight of the mediastinum, and the upward pressure from the abdominal contents on the diaphragm. 
The following are key characteristics of the dependent lung. Number one, atelectasis. The dependent lung becomes atelectatic, meaning it collapses or fails to inflate properly. This can reduce the lung's compliance, making it less stretchy and more resistant to filling with air. Two, compliance curve. The dependent lung shifts to a less compliant region of its pressure volume curve, meaning it becomes less elastic or stretchy. Compliance refers to the lung's ability to stretch and expand. When it is said that the lung shifts to the flatter portion of the compliance curve, it means the lung is less able to expand for each unit of pressure change. This condition is volume dependent, meaning it is more pronounced when lung volumes are lower. Three, gravity dependent blood flow. Even though the dependent lung receives less ventilation due to the above factors, it gets more blood flow because of gravity. When lying on the side, blood flow is pulled to the dependent lung by gravity. This creates a mismatch where the lung with more blood flow or the dependent lung is receiving less air, leading to inefficient gas exchange. In summary, in an anesthetized patient lying on their side, the lung on the bottom or dependent lung gets less air but more blood while the lung on the top or the non-dependent lung gets more air but less blood. This mismatch can make oxygenation and removal of carbon dioxide less efficient. Physiology. The following describe the key aspects regarding ventilation and perfusion in the anesthetized lateral position, closed chest, mechanically ventilated or paralyzed patient. Number one, decreased FRC. Mechanical ventilation in paralyzed patients means there is no spontaneous effort from the patient's diaphragm or intercostal muscles. This leads to a further decreased FRC. Two, compression of the dependent hemidiaphragm. The absence of diaphragmatic contraction combined with the weight of the abdominal contents compresses the dependent hemidiaphragm. Three, decreased compliance in the dependent lung. The mediastinum is displaced downwards by gravity when the patient is in a lateral position. This downward shift places added pressure on the dependent lung, making it less compliant. Four, ventilation shift to non-dependent lung. Because the dependent lung is less compliant and has reduced FRC, the mechanical ventilation tends to deliver more air to the non-dependent lung. This causes a ventilation mismatch as the non-dependent lung gets more ventilation than the dependent lung. Five, perfusion dominates in the dependent lung. Despite the ventilation shift to the non-dependent lung, perfusion is still dominated by gravity. Thus, the dependent lung, which is receiving less air, gets more blood flow. This situation leads to a mismatch between ventilation and perfusion. Positive end expiratory pressure, or PEEP, is a strategy used in mechanical ventilation where a positive pressure is maintained in the lungs at the end of expiration. The application of PEEP can increase the FRC 
by preventing alveolar collapse, which can help improve the ventilation to perfusion ratio. By keeping the alveoli open, PEEP ensures that more of the lung is available for gas exchange, potentially reducing the VQ mismatch. Physiology. The following describe the key aspects regarding ventilation and perfusion in the anesthetized lateral position, open chest, two lung mechanically ventilated or paralyzed patient. Number one, ventilation and perfusion mismatch. When the chest is opened, changes in intrathoracic pressures and lung mechanics exacerbate the mismatch between ventilation and perfusion. This scenario is where ventilation and perfusion mismatch is the greatest. Two, increased ventilation to non-dependent lung. Opening the thorax changes the dynamics of lung inflation. The non-dependent lung can inflate more easily while the dependent lung becomes less compliant. Three, change in lung compliance and flow resistance. As the non-dependent lung detaches from the chest wall due to the open thorax, there is reduced resistance to airflow and increased compliance. This further promotes ventilation to the non-dependent lung. Four, downward shift of the mediastinum. The lack of negative intrapleural pressure in the non-dependent lung combined with the gravity's effect causes the mediastinum to shift downwards. This movement compresses the dependent lung decreasing its compliance and ventilation. Mechanical ventilation is preferred over spontaneous respiration in open chest scenarios due to several reasons. Number one, preventing paradoxical breathing. When one lung collapses during an inhalation and expands during an exhalation, which is opposite of what is expected, it is called paradoxical breathing. This is prevented by mechanically controlling the lung's movements. Two, avoiding mediastinal shift. The shift of the mediastinum in an open chest scenario can be compared to what happens in a tension pneumothorax. Mechanical ventilation can help mitigate this shift. Despite all these changes in ventilation, gravity still dominates when it comes to blood flow. The dependent lung, which is now getting less air due to the reasons stated above, still receives more blood flow because it is lower and gravity pulls the blood down. Physiology the following describe the key aspects regarding ventilation and perfusion in the anesthetized lateral position, open chest, one lung ventilation patient. Number one, ventilation and perfusion mismatch improvement. By using one lung ventilation, the mismatch is improved as ventilation is specifically directed to only one lung, making it more efficient. Two, ceasing ventilation to non-dependent lung. One lung ventilation means that the non-dependent lung does not receive any ventilation. This allows for better oxygenation and ventilation of the dependent lung. Three, hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, or HPV. This is a protective reflex mechanism of the lungs. If a part of the lung becomes hypoxic, the blood vessels in that area constrict, 
This reduces blood flow to that hypoxic area and diverts it to better ventilated areas of the lung. In the context of one lung ventilation, HPV helps reduce the physiological shunt in the non-dependent lung by about 50%. This ensures that more blood is directed towards the dependent lung where ventilation is happening, thereby improving oxygenation. The following are determinants of blood flow in non-dependent lung during one lung ventilation. Number one, gravity. Blood tends to flow towards the lower parts of the body due to gravity. Two, surgical interference. Surgical procedures might directly or indirectly affect blood flow. Three, lung disease. Any existing disease in the non-dependent lung can affect its blood flow. Four, HPV in the non-dependent lung. As discussed, if parts of the non-dependent lung become hypoxic, the blood vessels there will constrict, reducing its blood flow. The following are determinants of blood flow in dependent lung. During one lung ventilation. Number one, gravity. Again, gravity plays a role favoring increased blood flow to the dependent lung. Two, dependent lung disease. Diseases or conditions affecting the dependent lung can change its blood flow. Three, HPV in the dependent lung. The mechanism of HPV also applies here, ensuring that well-ventilated parts of the dependent lung receive appropriate blood flow. Physiology. The anesthetized lateral position open chest, one lung ventilation is a scenario often encountered in thoracic surgeries and creates a unique physiological environment for the lungs. The non-dependent lung or upper lung receives no ventilation as this lung is collapsed during one lung ventilation. Since the non-dependent lung is not being ventilated, oxygen levels drop, and HPV acts to redirect blood away from this lung to the dependent lung. The dependent lung, or lower lung, receives 100% of the ventilation because it is the only lung ventilated during one lung ventilation. Due to gravity, the blood tends to pool more in the lower lung. Additionally, because of HPV redirecting blood away from the non-ventilated lung, the dependent lung gets an even greater share of the blood flow. In a typical scenario with two lung ventilation in the lateral position, Perfusion is distributed at about a 40% in the non-dependent to 60% in the dependent ratio because of the effects of gravity. When you switch to one lung ventilation, the non-ventilated, non-dependent lungs perfusion drops significantly due to HPV. The ratio changes and now the non-dependent lung gets about 20% of the perfusion, while the dependent lung gets about 80%. Physiology. The table reviews details about different states, the associated physiology, and ventilation to perfusion ratio. The first column is labeled state. This column describes the state of the patient, which can vary from being awake, anesthetized, the position, which includes upright or lateral, and whether the chest is open or closed. The type of respiration or ventilation is also mentioned. 
This includes spontaneous, two lung mechanical ventilation, and one lung mechanical ventilation. The next column is labeled physiology. This column describes the distribution of ventilation, or V, and perfusion, Q, in the lungs. The terms non-dependent and dependent refer to the upper lung and lower lung, respectively. The last column is labeled VQ ratio. This describes the ratio of ventilation to perfusion. The ideal scenario is when ventilation and perfusion are matched, but various conditions and states can lead to mismatches. The diagram on the top right represents the relationship between lung volume and pressure in different states. As you can see, lung compliance changes under various states. The image on the bottom right depicts open chest spontaneous respiration, which can cause paradoxical respiration and mediastinal shift. Hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. Hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, or HPV, is an adaptive response of the lungs to direct blood away from areas of low oxygen concentration, ensuring that the majority of blood flows through well-oxygenated portions of the lung. When certain areas of the lung are not receiving enough oxygen, maybe due to obstruction or disease, it would be wasteful for blood to flow through these areas only to come out without being oxygenated. Hence, the body constricts the blood vessels in these areas to redirect the blood to parts of the lung where there is more oxygen. This behavior of the pulmonary arteries is unique and contrasts with systemic arteries. In most other parts of the body, low oxygen levels cause vasodilation, but in the lungs, it results in vasoconstriction. It is important to understand that HPV is triggered by low oxygen levels in the alveoli rather than low oxygen levels in the arterial blood. The response to changes in oxygen levels is quick. When areas of the lung experience low oxygen, the onset of vasoconstriction is within seconds, and its peak effect is typically reached within about 15 minutes. Just as quickly as it begins, HPV can reverse. If the oxygen level increases, the pulmonary arteries will dilate restoring normal blood flow. Certain drugs and substances can influence HPV. For example, peripheral chemoreceptor agonists such as almatrine can enhance HPV. Hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. Hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction or HPV is a unique physiological response in the lungs. When alveolar oxygen levels decrease, the small pulmonary arteries constrict. This mechanism helps redirect the blood flow from poorly ventilated areas of the lung to better ventilated areas, optimizing oxygenation. However, several factors can inhibit or attenuate this natural response. Number one, alkalosis, a pH imbalance in the blood where it becomes too alkaline can inhibit HPV. Acidosis tends to enhance the HPV while alkalosis tends to reduce it. Two, excessive tidal volume or positive end expiratory pressure or PEEP. Overinflation of the lungs or high PEEP can interfere with the natural HPV response. Three, 
hemodilution. This refers to the dilution of blood, and it can weaken the HPV response. This might be seen in situations like massive fluid resuscitation. 4. Hypervolemia, such as a left atrial pressure greater than 25 millimeters of mercury, or elevated atrial natriuretic peptide. Excessive blood volume can increase left atrial pressure, which can inhibit HPV. Atrial natriuretic peptide released in response to increased atrial pressure also plays a role in attenuating the HPV response. 5. Hypocapnia. Low levels of carbon dioxide in the blood can inhibit HPV. The lungs have dual sensitivity to both oxygen and carbon dioxide levels, and changes in either can influence pulmonary vascular tone. 6. Hypothermia. Low body temperature can inhibit HPV. This is one reason why therapeutic hypothermia can impact oxygenation. 7. Prostacyclin. This is a naturally occurring prostaglandin that has vasodilatory effects on the pulmonary vasculature, thus inhibiting HPV. 8. Shunt fraction less than 20% or greater than 80%. A shunt refers to blood that bypasses the alveoli without participating in gas exchange. If the shunt fraction is too low or too high, it can influence the effectiveness of HPV. 9. Vasodilators, phosphodiesterase inhibitors, and calcium channel blockers. These medications can dilate the pulmonary blood vessels, inhibiting the natural HPV response. They are sometimes used in conditions like pulmonary arterial hypertension to decrease pulmonary arterial pressure. 10. Volatile anesthetics greater than 1.5 minimum alveolar concentration or MAC. Some anesthetic agents, when used in higher concentrations, can inhibit HPV. This is an essential consideration in the operating room setting as it can influence oxygenation during surgery. Thoracic surgery. Open thoracotomy is the traditional method used in thoracic surgeries where a large incision is made in the chest to access the thoracic organs. It is often considered the gold standard for many thoracic procedures because it provides a direct view and ample space for the surgeon to operate. Video assisted thoracoscopic surgery or VATS is a minimally invasive technique where small incisions are made in the chest. A thoracoscope and surgical instruments are inserted. The surgeon then performs the surgery while looking at a video monitor that displays the camera's view from inside the chest. However, there might be situations during VATS where unforeseen complications arise, making it necessary to convert to an open thoracotomy to ensure patient safety. The following are advantages of VATS over open thoracotomy. Number one, decreased postoperative pain. Due to smaller incisions, patients often experience less pain after surgery. Two, decreased incidence of postoperative respiratory dysfunction. Minimally invasive procedures often have lesser postoperative complications like respiratory problems. Three, shorter postoperative course. The recovery period after VATS is generally shorter than after an open thoracotomy. 4. Rapid recovery. This not only means that patients can resume their normal activity sooner, but also translates to shorter hospital stays and consequently reduced healthcare costs. During certain thoracic surgeries, especially in VATS, it is beneficial to ventilate only one lung. This process, called one lung ventilation, 
collapses the lung being operated on, providing the surgeon with a clearer view and more room to work. This is achieved using specialized equipment that directs the airflow into only one lung. Despite the advantages of one lung ventilation, many thoracic surgeries can be performed safely using two lung ventilation. In such cases, both lungs are ventilated with smaller volumes of air, ensuring that the surgical field remains stable.